So today we will cover some of the, uh, the good stuff, basically, how to get the juice out of the hardware, um, how to see what the performance numbers are, uh, how to um, performance uh, monitor the applications, some tools, some GUI interfaces which are pretty user friendly. Start off the morning with a demo. This was a workload done on the cell broadband engine by one of our tools of one of our uh, uh, business partners. And as I mentioned their name yesterday, RapidMind. And the reason we're showing this is because this is one real, uh, this was demoed in several conferences. And this is one real um, application that you can see on crowd simulation, basically, particle simulation. In this video, so we show I'll just start program, this. The person the who's talking in the background platform. is um, Stefano Stutwa. Um, this company originated from uh, Canada, uh, University of Waterloo. GPUs. So um, shown here it just came into existence a year back. It's a pretty new company. But uh, in the this thing is they have already demonstrated over 16,000 chickens they have, are being simulated uh, uh, full system uh, that was uh, each chicken looks to its and, uh, neighbors so it's to decide on its movement. For download you want this to quickly it. leads to the it's formation got, um, of flocks in the back and support and, uh, Let us follow a single uh, chicken in the crowd. We'll and take over control of the chicken okay. to show how the other chickens react. In order to give the other chickens some incentive to follow us, we'll change our control chicken into a rooster. What makes this demo interesting is that because it was written with the RapidMind development platform, it can run unmodified on any number of high-performance parallel processors, such as the cell, graphics processing units, or multi-core CPUs. The developer of this application did not have to know anything about these processors while writing the program. In fact, the basic algorithm for the simulation was written in a single day. We can vary how the chickens react by changing some basic parameters used in the simulation. Let's save our rooster by making the chickens more scared of one another. The change we've made to the chicken behavior quickly has a drastic effect on the overall shape of all the chickens. By zooming out to see the entire pen, we can watch how the chickens spread out. To mimic an online gaming environment, the simulation is computed on a server separate from the graphical client. The client can view one of four zones, all of which are computed simultaneously by the server. Note that both the server-side simulation and the client-side display we're implemented using standard C++ with the RapidMind development platform. Our platform integrates directly with C++, allowing developers to use their existing C++ skills and tools. For more information on RapidMind, please visit our website at www.rapidmind.net. The other demo that we have is on medical imaging. The comparison of a cell solution versus a PC solution. So this is the way that, that the PC is rendering and uh, reproducing the data. And that's the speed of cell processor. So you can see that uh, this PC solution takes two seconds per slice, six minutes to render entire, render entire volume versus cell. It just, just took two seconds to do the whole thing. So this was something that uh, we demoed also in a conference in Germany. And um, we got pretty good feedback from all, our, from the, all the people attending the event. So that's another demonstrated workload. All right, so uh, let's elaborate more on the SIMD part. How do we get the performance out? This is one of the, one of the features. Now, one thing that I want to say is that it's not uh, OK to expect that because we have nine, 8 plus 1, 9 cores, or, or you know, every application will be 10-way performance. We cannot. There are some applications. If the application is not a good fit for data level parallelism, or if the application has got a lot of random memory accesses and a lot of branches that are necessary to be taken, then you won't see, you won't probably even see 2x performance benefit. So it's a very certain 
type of applications, high performance computing, uh, certain algorithms in HPC, um, certain algorithms in seismic, or certain algorithms in aerospace and defense. So it's a certain category of applications which are good for supercomputing uh, environments are a good fit for cell. So we're not saying any or every application will definitely see a speed up. That it's possible that it will be negative speed up. So it depends from application to application. There have been, we have identified a whole lot of applications which have a lot of real world relevance and a lot of emerging uh, technology uh, aspects to it that uh, have been proven to be really good uh, scientifically. Uh, when run on cell broadband engine. So this is one, a SIMD programming, single instruction, multiple data. How do we save on clock cycles? How do these multiple cores give us the performance benefit is what we'll cover in this presentation. <coughs> so let's see. So via SIMD, we are exploiting data level parallelism. Yesterday I had to have gone over some things that we are operating on vectors. We're not doing so many loads Right? For 16 uh, characters, uh, 16 bytes of data, we're not doing six, the load 16 times. We are operating on vectors, we're only doing one load. That saves you 15 more cycles to, do go, to go do something else. And not only that, not only just the load part, even the compute part, the arithmetic part, we don't have to do 16 additions to do computations on 16 uh, characters or 16 bytes. We are only doing one cycle to do you know, be it an add or a multiply or, or, or a subtract or whatever arithmetic operation it is. We're only doing one instead of 16 cycles. You have saved time on loads, you have saved time on compute. And there's only one part of it. There's many more aspects that come together. So the SIMD concept is fully exploited on the cell processor. The SPUs are, are very well equipped with the power uh, to do uh, all kinds of vector operations. So each, uh, as we have seen, there's 128 registers. They're all vector registers. <clears throat> and uh, they are 128 bit wide, so 16 bytes in length. And uh, you can store four wide full words, uh, that is 32 bits, or half words, eight of them are 16 wide bytes. And again, to illustra illustrate the uh, simple addition uh, point, in one cycle, we're dealing with, say, four integers, for example. So register A, vector A, will contain 16 bytes. That is four floats or four integers. And in one cycle, so we have already loaded 16 bytes at a time, right, or four flow integers at a time, another four integers at a time. And, uh, and then in one cycle, we're doing four adds. Versus compared to a scalar architecture, what would you do? You would do A0 plus B0 equal to C0 in one cycle, right? In the next cycle, you do A1 plus B1 equals C1. The next cycle, you do A2 plus B2 equals C2. That's a normal, typical sequential program. With cell processor, or actually, you know, with, with this concept of vectorizing or simdizing, so to say, this is also a process known, called, known as simdizing, is where we are trying, start trying to save on cycles everywhere. Let's pick up an example. And another concept of SIMD. So all the data are stored in 16 byte boundaries, right? Loads and stores are on 16 by, uh, are 16 byte uh, aligned. And also um, all accesses, all computations are on 16 byte boundaries. So let's pick up one vector, B0 through B3. It is storing four, four byte wide values. So register R1, R1 has got B0 through B3, and R2 has got C0 through C3. Now this is one vector, like in, uh, and this is the second vector. We do an add, they're always, sequ always aligned. So in other words, if you want to do a B0 plus C2, if you add R1 plus R2, you won't get the result in the correct location. And we'll see another example about that. But whenever you add R1 plus R2, always, they're always added in order. Like in other words, B0, will B0 can only be added to C0, B1 can only be added to C1, and B2 can only be added to C2. So whenever we do any computations between two vectors, they're always uh, done uh, in the same alignment, in the same offsets. Okay? So SIMD cross-element instructions. Um, we have support for shifts and rotates. 
uh, permute and shuffle. So it's a similar concept uh, like in the in a traditional vector processing you call it permute where basically uh, let's pick up this, uh, this register right. So we have whenever we load 16 bytes if we want to just load B1 we cannot do that. It will, it will load it <laughs> wanted or not it will always load 16 bytes at a time. So we have to really find out where data is located. So data uh, location, the offset of the data within a vector is really critical when it comes to SIMD operations. So sometimes data does not reside in the place where we want to. For example, if we want to do B0 plus, uh, you know, if we want to do, um, if we want B2 to be located in B0, right, in this slot and not over here. If we want to move the things around, how do we do that? So obviously the architecture has to provide some options. Those are shifts and rotates. So you can do a rotate shift to move a byte of information to another slot. You can move four bytes at a time to another slot. So you can give indexes and say, okay, I want this data to be residing right here. It's particularly important in, 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 in a lot of image processing applications, a lot of gaming based applications where uh, you want to pack and unpack values. You have RGB values. So when you're operating on a vector, uh, in a vector fashion on RGB values, you want to apply some kind of, say, shading to all the red values, right? And all the green values and all the blue values. Once you're done doing that computation, you want to store the data as RGB, 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 and not as all reds and not as all greens and all blues, right? The image has to appear like an image and not rectangles of red and green and blue, right? So when we have to combine all these values, or even if a grayscale image, right, 0 through 255 pixels, we want to do any kind of computations. At the end of the day, you want to combine them together. That's when permute and shuffle is a very low overhead, very lightweight operation, extremely useful. So one of our goals also at the end of the day is to make sure that the, at least a shuffle operation, which is like a pillar, um, a very important concept in vector programming is well understood uh, by everyone. <clears throat> and we'll see an example of shuffle very soon. So basically shuffle will pick up the source register and we can set a flag like a mask. It's like I want this byte from this register in this location. I want this byte from this register in this location. You set a mask, create a mask and you apply it to your input data. The resultant data will be exactly in the way you want. And this is an example. So shuffle operation. So we have register VA and VB. Right? And uh, Let's see. And we want the data to be located like this. So in other words, uh, vector VA has got all these values, A0, A1, A2, in this manner. But I, you know, you may be a person that, oh, I'm not that organized, right? I don't want such sequential boring data. I want some excitement. I want to move data around, right? So I want in this location, um, I want one, and over here I want four and eight, and this is the rearrangement that you want. How do we do that very simply? Very straightforward. Basically, we create this mask register and we say the first byte, now remember this is, these are all byte wide. So this is four bits, right? And this is four bits. So in this mask register, we create a register VT and we initialize that register with values, with values which Basically, A will all the input, input register vector V1 will always be considered as 0 and input register uh, input vector V2 will always be a 1. So we, we want to create initialize uh, this mask by saying 0, 1. That means from the 0th uh, vector, that is the first vector, <coughs> pick up the first element. From the B vector, vector which is 1, would pick up the, uh, the first, uh, sorry, pick up the fourth element. So in other words, pick up this value. From vector B, pick up the eighth element. So in other words, the first four bits will, all, uh, will either be 0 or 1. So you, in, in real world, when you initialize the vector VT, it would look like hex. It would look like hex. 0, 1 would be the first byte. Second byte would be hex 1, 4, right? The third byte. The fourth byte would be hex uh, one zero. So by assume, by observing the first four bits value, you find out which register am I supposed to pick up the value from. And the, by observing the next four bits, you find out which value should I pick up from that register. So when we look at A six over here, 
we want to say in this same location right here in this same location we want to pick up the value the sixth element the sixth byte from vector a which is here and place it in this location from this vector b we want to pick up the fifth element b5 and put it right here from vector b we want to pick up 9 and put it right here so as you define the mask byte by byte that byte value in the same location will hold the resultant of you know which vector you're picking up from and what value you're picking up from each vector okay and it's purely byte oriented as it says and native SIMD programming there's intrinsics there's instructions as we discussed yesterday and they look like this spu underscore add will add if a and b are two integers it will do four adds right vector a will contain four integers at a time and vector b will contain four integers at a time data types care float they all look the same as the traditional uh, programming language they are always aligned on 16 byte boundaries now if we say vector uh, float star p right p is pointing to a memory location that holds 16 bytes of data so what will p plus 1 be it is basically you have jumped ahead another 16 bytes right so we have to keep that in mind when we do you know p plus plus it's pointing to the next 16 bytes and again these are the instructions that we looked at yesterday spu underscore splats what it does is it will take a value a scalar value and it will replicate on all the if it's a vector float and if you want if you have an integer 2 and you want to initialize uh, you want to replicate 2 in all the four vector elements or uh, four integer elements in one vector it will put 2 2 2 2 uh, this is what splats does uh, similarly on characters and we have coding examples that we'll cover this we saw yesterday and let's see a pick up a simple example now <clears throat> how do we do vector operations this is a simple scalar code right in normal real world until now we have this is how we write programs scalarly if we have an input variable in one input variable into output variable out and the number of iterations that we want to do so we initialize the loop like 0 through n right and then out 1 is equals in 1 into into a simple multiplication and we run this n number of times now how does cell give its power to this program so to start with we convert all the input variables that are the scalar values that are coming in into vector values so convert and it's as simple as that it's just a simple typecast to convert it into vector so take all your scalar input values in one into and out and convert them into float that is win one win two and win uh, v out right and now let's come to the loop now since all these input variables are now pointing to four vectors at a time as a four integers at a time instead of one integer if we do a multiplication do we have to run the loop uh, 16 times or n number of times n by 4 right so now we have already saved some loops loops are extremely uh, even though they are highly predictable there is still some overhead in the branch because there is there's at least two instructions you save the current uh, position a branch and something branch and um, save and then you go back to where you last left so avoiding loops is a key to also is also one important key to getting performance out of uh, applications so we have saved on the loops another concept that we will be looking at later on is instead of doing this one loop uh, over here we can do v out of i plus plus equals the next four elements so in other words in one loop iteration you're doing one multiplication on four bytes you can do another on the next four bytes in the same loop you can uh, do another four uh, four uh, multiplications that's called loop unrolling in which case you'll be dividing nv by two another two times because you're doing two of these operations in one loop and that's another concept that we'll be covering so this is how we are achieving data level parallelism instead of operating on one byte uh, one uh, element at a time we are uh, operating on four elements at a time in one clock cycle this is another simd example um, so in the scalar code we are doing i equal to 0 through 4 4k <coughs> increment the i and basically we are just incrementing uh, the destination vector input vector in in the simd uh, in the simd fashion basically well first of all uh, 
you initialize uh, you basically create another vector and initialize to it to 1 1 1 1 because we what we want to do is we don't want to increment it one at a time we want to increment four elements and in one uh, in one at one time so we do sp underscore add of v dest which is a convert to a typecast uh, uh, vector from destination and then we add the value v1 to it which consists of all ones so in one loop it's adding it's incrementing all the va values of the arrays another vectorization example is over here so if you have a 4 by 4 matrix right in a 4 by SIMD fashion now imagine now we instead of st storing one uh, y1 value in one vector we're storing four vertices or four matrices uh, matrix values so in this case it's a dot pro product so now we can do what we can assume is basically each row of the matrix is one vector right because there's four values we can store it in one vector assuming they're all integers or floating point data so we can store the x values another in another vector and y value is another vector register multiply the row register by the act uh, in this whole row by the uh, x vector register and perform vector reduction in the product uh, again this is all and now more, more uh, concepts of uh, data level parallelism Inst instead of doing one dot product at a time uh, or one uh, vector reduction at a time we're doing four times vector reduction and another approach to this x vector is in a vector register y vector is another register you can copy the element basically into all four sl uh, slots just like we did the splat, uh, splat operation earlier you can replicate the scalar element in in all four um, element locations and create an empty vector initialize it replicate the scalar value in all the four locations and just use that to use an SPU mod or uh, mul or SPU add with the uh, with the input register so different strategies of doing the same thing and this is the how we this is another thing is that we can always uh, store data in a vector across manner or a parallel array manner in other words say you have vertices you have x y z and w vertices right you can all how do you store it in uh, data arrays you can all uh, you can store uh, you can create like one vector which contains x y z and w so all 16 bytes in one vector right so all these vectors will be a mixture of all v0 through vn vertices or what can be done is in one vector you store all x values so x0 x1 x2 x, x3 so there will be a list of vectors that will contain all, only the x values list of vectors that contain only the y values and only the z values so depending upon how your computation is done and what you the manner which is more simpler to you you can pick your approach so there's opportunities for loop run unrolling and uh, software pipelining as we discussed so what supporting approach basically first you write the simd program first for the ppu it's it's again your preference sometimes you may just say oh i don't want to worry about writing code on the ppu and then porting it over to the spu right or what you want to do is basically just take a scalar program convert it fully into vector and run it on the ppu right use the vector instructions and once you have the entire application running on the ppu then observe okay what are the parts that i can break off as a module and send it in create put it into a thread spe thread and fire off let that spe do the work so it, you can pick an approach that's most convenient and why, when we when we do try to split the work into the other spus you have to think about strategies right you may be splitting the data up into 64k chunks and sending it over to the spu what is the code size once you build the application how much is the code size coming to depending upon that the, you can you have to divide the data okay i'm using up 200k for my code size only you're only left with 56k of data so obviously there's something wrong there's too much code and you know uh, and and very less room for data then you have to see maybe i don't need this code to be running on the spu maybe this can run on the ppu so only the code that does hardcore computation should be offloaded to the SPU so that there is a decent balance between the code size and the data you can send it off for computations. Let's pick another example of complex multiplication. Now, this is a really good example because this is gives us uh, gives us a real view of uh, how to do uh, multiplications and how to do use these SPU intrinsics. So, A plus IB equals C plus ID. This, so this is something that we learned in what fifth <laughs> fifth standard, right? Fifth or sixth. So, A plus IB plus c plus into c plus id 
is AC minus BD. So in this case, I, the B and D values are the imaginary values. So in a, in a scalar form, normally what you would have to do is uh, when you, in your simple code, right, your input vector is input 1, that is consisting of 2n elements. The reason it's 2n elements is because it's storing A, the, for the real part and the immediately following the real part is the imaginary number. So the real number and the imaginary number. So input 1 will be consisting of A0, B0, A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3 and so on. Input vector 2 will be consisting of C1, uh, C0, D0, C1, D1, C2, D2, C3, D3 and so on. So they are interleaving the real and imaginary parts into the two input arrays. And similarly, the resultant will be containing the real and imaginary parts interleaved fashion. So in the scalar code, this is what we do, right? AC minus BD. And we do that n number of times, right? We, do, we compute AC by multiplying the input vector of 1 into input of input 2 of i, right? And then compute BD and then we do AC minus BD to compute the output array. Now let's, let's, let's see the hard part. This is how simple the scalar code looks like. However, it's not as efficient. So how do we make it, you know, 100 more lines but more efficient is what the RSPU code will look like. So I1, the input vector 1 will be SPU underscore shuffle of A1, A2 and I perm vector. So let's understand this step. This is how the input data looks like in, in memory, right? We're storing A1, B1 and A2, B2 in one vector because at the most we can store how many elements in one vector if it's a, if it's a 4 byte uh, wide integer? 4 because we're having 16 bytes in one vector. So at a time we can store only 4 bytes. So in other words, we can only have A1, B1 and A2, B2 at one time in one vector. So, so let's pick up A1, one vector. The next vector is A2 which will be containing A3, B3. A3 is the real part, B3 is the imaginary part and then A4 is the real part and the B4 is the imaginary part. Similarly for the second uh, vector, B1. So this is all vector A, this is vector B. Vector A consists of A1, A2, A4, A3, A4, so on till n by 4 and B1 contains C1, D1, C2, D2, so on till you know by 4. So in this case, now we want to compute the sum AC. In other words, we want to multiply all the values of A with all the consecutive values of C. However, in memory they are stored as A1 and B1 and A2 and B2. So now if we multiply A1 into B1, the result will be what? A1, C1 and then B1, D1. Instead, what we want to do is we want to store all the A1 values together and in one clock cycle, we want to multiply, we, do, we want to do four multiplications, right? We want to multiply all the A1, A2, A3, A4 values with all the C1, C2, C3, C4 values. So now we have to create a shuffle mask. So how do we create the, the shuffle mask? This is the input shuffle mask. So we, three, we, say, <coughs> we say 0 through 3. So pick up the first 4 bytes from the input vector 0, right, which is A1. So pick up 0 through 3, that is A1 value. Then pick up 8 through 11, which is what? A2. Imagine, right, this is what? 0 through 16, uh, 0 through 15. A1 vector, right? This is 16 bytes. So this is 0, 3, 7 and so on till, till 15. This is 16 through 31, right? You get the picture? So when we say pick up uh, 0 through 3, we're saying from the 0th vector pick up 0 through 3 bytes, right? Which is vector uh, A1 and then 8 through 11 would be A2 and then 16 through 19, if you convert it into hex, the first 4 bits will yield a 1, so which will be vector V2, this is the second input vector, this is input vector A1 and input vector A2. So pick up 16 through 19 and then pick up 24 through 77 which is uh, 27 which is A4. 
So now apply the mask and we do the shuffle operation. So SPU underscore shuffle input vector A1, input vector A2 and then I underscore perm vector which is the shuffle mask. It is always a vector unsigned char shuffle mask. So now in our resultant vector we have all the A1, A2, A3, A4 values together. Okay. And then let us compute the, uh, the result B1, D1. Now we have all the A1 values together, all the B1 values together, all the C1 values together and all the D1 values together. So now we want to compute B1, D1. So we use the NM sub instruction. Basically it will just do a multiplication and negate it. Right? <clears throat> and then we do a, um, a multiply add of B1 and C1, right? B2, C2, B3, C3 and B4, C4. So th this is why we need to break out all the real and imaginary parts together. So we have in A2 value now, we have B1, C1 and B2, C2, B3, C3 and B4, C4. And then, so basically it's just computing stage by stage, right? What, the, what are the essential parts that we need? We need AC and BD. Okay. So you compute all these things. So we have A1, D1 and plus B1, C1 finally. One product is computed and then A1, C1 and B1, D1 also for the next uh, I1 and I2 values. So these are the essential parts of all the, the whole complex uh, multiplication arithmetic. Okay, so now we have the input vector A1, C1 and B1, D1 values, A2, C2 and B2, D2 values, A3, C3 and B3, D3 values and A4, C4 minus B4, D4. So because we computed the A1, C1 product and we computed the minus of B1, D1 product, right? We did the multiplication and the negate right here, over here. So we have these values computed and we have the uh, B1, D1, uh, A1, C1 values computed. We also have the A1, D1 and the B1, C1 values computed. Now we need to store them uh, back into the memory. So we will create a shuffle pattern because the way we want to store it, the resultant vector, the way we want to store it is basically we want to put uh, the product elements together. In other words, when we store it back in the memory, we, we want all the AC minus BD values right a0 c0 minus b0 d0 and the next one has to be what a1 exactly so we want to store it in the memory also like that so that's what uh, that is happening over here so basically we can we just use the shuffle mask to our benefit and finally get the end result and the key to observe over here one thing to note down and, and this example program is also there in the hands-on session so when you look at the code it all comes together better you know versus a powerpoint slide in the hands-on we can go over it one more time but uh, is the, the key to notice is that we are trying to parallelize and reduce a lot of clock cycles is the key to understand over here instead of doing scalar computations n number of times we're trying to do it n by 4 n by 8 you know n by 60 reduce the number of arithmetic operations.